I am Chris Davis. I'm the Deputy Chief of the Portland Police Bureau. And today I'll give you a briefing on what we're seeing on a nightly basis, what we have seen over the last several weeks, uh, and give you some ideas of what we're trying to do to mitigate this really uh, challenging nightly event that we're experiencing in downtown Portland and some other places. But I want to start with a little bit of context. The level of violence and criminal activity and, and property damage that we have seen uh, in the events, especially downtown and at some other places that we'll talk about in a minute, is really unprecedented in Portland's history. We are now in our sixth week of these events, and we're always hopeful that we're winding down, but we're six weeks into this. We've never seen this intensity of violent focused criminal activity over this long of a period of time, at least in the time that I have been here. There have been literally uh, over a hundred injuries, both of city employees and of members of the public over the course of the last six weeks from these events. We've seen an estimate of $23 million in damage and lost business in downtown Portland, which means lost jobs and all of that on top of the COVID crisis. A walk through downtown today will expose you to a scene of boarded up windows, extensive damage to public property, uh, and, and really uh, an unfortunate scene in our city center. Quite frankly, this is not sustainable. Violence and damage have displaced the message about systemic change in the wake of the George Floyd murder. There's a very big difference between protests and the kind of mayhem that we've seen every night. And you're going to hear me make a lot of effort not to refer to what we're talking about here as protests, because protests and this are two different things. The Black Lives Matter movement is not violent. This story that we're going to talk about today is about a small group of agitators that is attempting to hijack that message and use it as a cover for criminal activity. I want to be clear as I frame this discussion here today that the City of Portland and the Portland Police Bureau support peaceful protests. We took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States, and that includes the First Amendment right to free speech and free expression and freedom of the press. The City of Portland and the Portland Police Bureau supports the idea that black lives matter. But, as I said, this message is being lost in a nightly scene of violence, property damage, and criminal activity that is completely inconsistent with this community's values. And we all need to work together to put a stop to what we've seen over the last several weeks. So I will start with a timeline of events, and I'll summarize some of the significant events, but I just ask that we keep in mind that we've seen this kind of criminal activity pretty much every night since about May 28th. And this all started on May 28th with a small demonstration at a, an ICE facility in southwest Portland. And it wasn't a very large event, but one item of significance there is at that event, someone threw a Molotov cocktail into a wall of the building down there. But the really big ongoing event started on May 29th. Uh, the, what happened on May 29th is there was a, a mainstream protest event. Uh, and then this group split off from that later in the evening. This was a more violent episode of civil unrest than we had, than I have ever seen in my entire career in the Portland Police Bureau, uh, and really than in, in living memory. There were, we encountered widespread burglary, theft, property damage, and fires being set downtown, assaults on police officers. At one point, agitators broke windows and stormed the sheriff's office records section in this building on the Third Avenue side. Uh, there was a group of records employees working there at the time. The office was ransacked, and there were fires set in the office. Uh, we encountered extensive vandalism to the federal courthouse, and thus began the unprecedented situation that we still see six weeks later. So this is some video here at the Justice Center. 
on May 29th. There's a fire inside the building. In response to this event, we set up a pretty large fenced off area, including Chapman and Lounsdale squares. Uh, this intent of this area was to develop some distance from the Justice Center while the Sheriff's Office tried to get uh, some, some boards up on the windows and start to repair the damage. Uh, we found out pretty early on that this large of a fenced off area was going to be very difficult to maintain because what we encountered was groups of people trying to breach this fence in different places and it just took, it was very resource intensive to try to maintain that. So pretty quickly after that we decided to collapse the fenced area just to the immediate vicinity of the Justice Center. And at this point, this was the very beginning of June and what we were encountering daily were, was uh, kind of the formation of two different things. Earlier in the day, we would see really, really large, peaceful protest groups, uh, often going on very large marches, sometimes over 10,000 people. And these events really didn't need a lot of police interaction. We, for some of those, we didn't even show up because there really wasn't a need for police. They were very well organized and they were not, they didn't involve any kind of crimes or violence or anything like that. And the organizers were able to keep those events orderly and productive without us. So we took a hands-off approach to those events. Um, but then there was a second group that after those events would show up down here and focus their energy on the Justice Center. Um, pretty early on, we noticed that it looked like the organizers of the larger legitimate protest events sort of distanced themselves from some of the elements that we are seeing more as agitators, and we got into just a cycle of nightly attacks on, on this building, on the Justice Center. Focused a lot of times on the fence around the building, and then the sheriff's office side of the Justice Center. The sheriff's office uh, obviously had a lot of the windows broken out on their side and had to have staff out there to try to secure this building. This building houses the Multnomah County Detention Center, which has uh, hundreds of adults in custody at any given time. Uh, so it was a pretty important safety mission to keep this sort of activity of window breaking and fires from happening in a building full of people. Uh, the Sheriff's Office staff on the 3rd Avenue side of the building experienced a large number of attacks, including things thrown at them like bottles, rocks, uh, and fireworks. And what came into focus for us was a fairly well-organized agitator core, and then a larger group of people who just seemed to be coming downtown to see what would happen. And what we noticed happening was this agitator core trying to bring this whole group together, and we'll talk a little bit more about this here in a minute, and direct everyone's energy at the attacks on the Justice Center. So on June 15th, we moved the fence. Um, but before we get to that, this little clip of video here is taken on June 6th, and this shows when we've brought the fence down to the smaller area this is a group of officers standing out here. A couple things to point out here. Notice how these water bottles, as they hit the ground, don't break. Normally a pretty flimsy plastic water bottle like that, launched from that distance with that kind of velocity, you would expect to break and water go everywhere. The reason for that is that a lot of these water bottles are frozen. You can also see a red laser that gets shined in officers' eyes at a couple of different points. This officer over here on the right may have happened already. 
and Southwest Madison Street. Leave now. And you can look in the street and see some of the volume of projectiles that we were having thrown at officers at this point. So what we noticed over time as we had this fence around the Justice Center is the fence really started to become the focus of a lot of this activity. And we made a decision in an attempt to de-escalate this to take the fence down. Um, we wanted to get that focus again away from the agitator group. This goes on like this and we can make these videos available to you. We'll get to this scene here in a minute. But we removed the fence uh, because it had just become the focus of the agitators. People were trying to knock it down. There was a lot of that kind of activity that you just saw of projectiles coming over the fence at either our employees or sheriff's office employees. And so we made a decision to try to just keep officers inside this building and only come out if, we, if there was some kind of attack on the building in hopes that removing that fence and focus of the energy would de-escalate the crowd and they would stop what they were doing. Unfortunately, this did not work. Our disruptive crowd responded to this by actually increasing the intensity of their attacks. At one point, we had doors barricaded shut with a U-lock in this building plywood would be pried off of windows that had been broken. Uh, at one point, there was a, an attempt to access the first and Jefferson parking garage where some city vehicles are stored. There's also a fueling station in there. At one point, we had to station a group of officers in there to try to keep people from accessing that because of the obvious danger of fire. And uh, we've got some other video that we won't look at here today in the interest of time of people piling up objects and dumpsters in front of the garage door to keep the officers inside. Uh, lots of use of fireworks. Uh, the violence ratcheted up, the setting of fires, more vandalizing of businesses. And what it looks like is, was really an attempt to escalate to the point where we had to come out to protect life and property in downtown Portland. And then our officers would be attacked. And again, just the nightly attacks on the sheriff's office employees uh, outside on the 3rd Avenue side. This went on for a while. And then on June 25th, we had an attack on our North Precinct at Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard in Killingsworth. In this event, this is one scene of the building at North Precinct and some of the graffiti that was painted there. You can see a lot of references to killing police officers, headless pigs with police hats, those kind of things. This really sort of speaks for itself. And then a really disturbing development. Doors were barricaded shut. And here's just two examples of doors in the, to the precinct that were barricaded shut. And you can see they used wood. They used screws. Our officers inside the, the building actually heard screws being driven into the wall with a drill um, to barricade these doors shut. And then, as you can see on the right, they set fire to the north side of the building, which contains some businesses. But that's all the same building. And we were very fortunate that that fire was interrupted before it caught that whole building on fire. That's a pretty old building with a lot of wood framing in it. And had this fire been able to take off with people barricaded inside the building, the results would have been catastrophic. One of the things that's important to note about this is that when the fire was set, it was actually set in a dumpster. It was on wheels. And then that dumpster was rolled up against the building to try to set it on fire. And again, you can see some of the sentiment that was painted on the walls of North Precinct. On June 29th, our group came back downtown and did some fairly extensive vandalism to City Hall. You can see a 
security camera that was destroyed there and a lot of spray paint on the stone surface of the building and a city vehicle there. And then on June 30th, uh, the, the event started with a rally in Peninsula Park and a group of people began marching towards the Portland Police Association building at North Lombard and Campbell. We, once we saw what direction they were going, we moved some of our resources, including some of our Portland police officers and some Oregon State troopers that were assisting us that night. Um, once the group got to Lombard and Campbell, fires were set in rolling dumpsters again and rolled out into the street. Uh, we believe that the state police crowd control team likely prevented the PPA headquarters from being set on fire at this point. One of the things that was striking to me about this event was the volume of projectiles that the state police reported that were being thrown at them over a pretty long period of time. Some of the things that were thrown included softball-sized rocks, some of which hit police officers and state troopers, uh, frozen water bottles again, glass bottles, full beer cans, uh, marbles launched from slingshots, we had some officers, as did the state police, injured by projectiles. Were lasers shined in officers' and troopers' eyes, which involved some injuries. Uh, and the challenge in this area is a couple of things, one of which is fire, because this is a pretty old neighborhood. And I'll show you, we'll come back to this video here in a minute, but I'll show you, this is the location of this building in North Portland, and you can see the really close proximity of businesses and houses in this neighborhood. There's a residential neighborhood right up against the commercial properties that go along Lombard. These tend to be older wood-framed houses. They're very close together, and the danger of fire here is pretty extreme. If we allowed this building on the corner here to be set on fire, uh, with a crowd that size, moving that crowd out of there in time for firefighters to get there and keep that fire from spreading would be very challenging. And so that's one of the considerations that we had to think about in responding to this. We'll skip through this a little bit just in the interest of people's time. We'll, we'll find a way to make any videos that you'd like available to you. Um, but this is just kind of a mashup of some of what we saw that night. And keep in mind, this went on for a while. This went on for over an hour before we ended up having to use CS gas to disperse this crowd. You'll see, you can see the, some of the projectiles being thrown, a lot of stuff in the street already. There goes water bottle right there. We're also using smoke. You can see some of the fires that were lit in this video. And this is edited for time. This video is well over an hour long, but. This is video that we've obtained from open source from a variety of sources. But no, we, this is not video that we took in the police bureau. We got this off of open sources. So by this point, fires have been lit. You can see a fire burning right there behind the bus kiosk. You can see a guy throw something right there. So the officers had to move up to try and address this fire that is right next to an apartment building. Move east, move to the east, move, move. You can see smoke being deployed by the crowd. And at some points in this, you'll see where our officers deploy smoke. That big plume of smoke is where they just put the fire out. One of the questions that we've been asked a lot uh, when smoke is deployed is if that's CS gas. It isn't necessarily. There are times where we will deploy smoke in order to move groups of officers. 
this lawful order may subject you to arrest and force to include crowd control of munitions. Move to the east now. Disperse. This event has been deemed an unlawful assembly. This goes on like this. You can see the change in the energy level in the crowd. Did you see that right there? And then it comes back down a little bit in this part of the clip. That's very common in events like this, that that crowd energy level will kind of come and go and just gradually build and reduce and then build more. And That's smoke. Right there. And if, you know, I was listening to the radio at the same time this was going on, and we have a transcript of, of radio broadcasts, or a, a log of radio broadcasts, and just as this went on over the course of over an hour, what is less apparent in these videos is just the number of objects being thrown at police officers at this point as this went on. And there's where some of the fireworks starting to get fired at officers. In a little while, we're going to talk about some crowd dynamics that we train on. This is a really bad sign when this starts right here. Again, we're in a residential area full of wood frame buildings. And at this point, We've just given the CS gas warning. You're pretty deep in the crowd, so you can't see the activity that's going up, going on up ahead. And then here's where we had to deploy CS gas in order to move this crowd, but this was well over an hour into this event with persistent projectiles and other threats to life safety. So then we move up to July 4th. And on July 4th, there was a large group that gathered for a rally in Lounsdale Square. Uh, they attacked some of the Federal Protective Service office officers that were trying to protect the uh, federal courthouse. At one point, Someone launched a mortar-style firework into the building. They actually gained, got the doors open enough and launched a mortar inside the building. And uh, at that point, uh, evidently, the Federal Protective Service deployed CS gas again to disperse the crowd. The crowd regrouped, began walking in streets downtown, threw fireworks and other objects at officers, again set fire, damaged property. We'll show you some video from that night. There's a few things that are, I think, that these videos help understand. Uh, we're gonna talk about the role of fire in this type of events here in a little bit, but pay attention to the fires. You can see some really low grade, like ground level fireworks going off over there. The green lasers, we're gonna talk about those here in a minute. And these people are burning a flag that's up against the plywood on the Third Avenue side of the building, on the sheriff's office side. This is fairly early on in the event. See, it's a fairly large crowd here. There's a security camera up there. That's what all of the 
bright lights and green lasers are being focused on. See the reference to dead cops, burned pigs. So we are continuing to see this kind of activity. I wanted to just in the chronology give you some of the high points that we've seen so far. But again, activity like this has gone on almost every night since May 29th. So now I want to talk just a little bit about some of the, in, in broader terms, some of the tactics that we're seeing. We'll make this available as a PDF for you. This is not secret information here. This, we got this off the internet. Um, this picture popped up a lot uh, on social media and on the internet uh, right as events began. I'm not sure exactly what the origin of this is. We're still working on trying to figure this out, but this is not our diagram. We got this off of, off of the internet. And I, wanted, I won't read this to you because you can really see it yourself, but I want to point out a couple of the more noteworthy elements of this strategy here. These shield soldiers up here, uh, these are the folks all the way up at the front line. Peaceful protesters, often by the organizers of this kind of thing, will, they'll try to get the, the people that just kind of show up to see what's going on, but they're not quite all in on throwing things and engaging in violence. They'll try and get them to go up towards the front. And I'm going to show you a video that illustrates a lot of this here in a minute. Um, and then the light mages, those are the people with the laser pointers right there in blue. You'll see people with slingshots, fire mage. I didn't make these terms up, and I don't know if this is what everyone calls these, but these are the people who throw flammable stuff and fireworks all the way back to the communications people and some of the people who are trying to organize the group. Um, what we have learned over the years about events like this is that agitators will come to events with other people who are into whatever's going on to varying degrees. And their objective is to use crowd dynamics, really, to get people to stop being individual identifiers and become collective identifiers, and then direct that energy against their objective, which in this case is usually the Justice Center. Um, You'll hear a lot of times when we interview people who get arrested for crimes related to this kind of disorder that I, I don't know why I did that. I don't know what got into my head. I just got swept away in the moment. And that's really the objective here is to try to generate that process. So this is some video. This is from June 11th, I believe. Whoops, helps to hit the right button. This is from June 11th, in downtown Portland, right over here at First Avenue, and I think that's Madison Street. Excuse me, Second and Jefferson. So on the right-hand side are the people. You'll see this get organized fairly quickly, but the police are actually off to the right. I promise this gets more stable here in a minute. In, in a minute here, you're going to see everybody's hands go up almost at once. And you'll hear somebody yelling, hands up, hands up, because they're getting commands from the police officer, from the police down the street. And by this point, there's been projectiles launched and thrown at the officers. You'll see the people with umbrellas up in the front. That's very common. But the real action is going on behind this group of people with their hands up, and you're about to see that right now. See that guy telling everybody, get your hands up? So did you see the guy come from behind the line and throw that? That's that set of tactics in action right there. And then the objective as the police start moving is to try and get these people to stand there in the way as long as you can while all the people who were engaged in criminal activity get away. This is a Portland police bureau. This is a civil disturbance and we have declared 
Um, one of the reasons why we believe that the Third Avenue side of the Justice Center is often the focus of this is the park across the street gives sufficient depth of field for all of those layers to come together. And it's also a really ready source of supply from behind their, the line, if you will, on 4th Avenue. It's really easy to get a car down 4th Avenue, and we've seen where crowds have been supplied with things to throw at police officers and other items from 4th Avenue. And so that's, that's not a new phenomenon. It's been like that for a long time, but that's one of the reasons why I think you see this happen so much on the sheriff's office side of the building. It's not necessarily that they're directing their energy at the sheriff's office. It's just much, it's a much better place to engage in tactics like this in terms of the environment. Um, and then here, this shows some of the organization efforts. Again, trying to get that group of unconnected people to start thinking together and moving together in pursuit of whatever the objective is. And so what you're going to see here, this is on July 4th. This is after the Federal Protective Service has dispersed the crowd that was in the park after the attack on the, on the courthouse. And the group is fairly disorganized, but just watch how people are trying to regroup this group of people so that they can get them back focused on that common objective. The chants are part of that, trying to get everybody together. Now calling for shields to move up to the front. This group is not restricted from leaving this area at all. They can walk away behind the view of the camera all they want. They are not trapped in this area at this time. They're just reorganizing themselves. So you see the umbrellas there. It's not raining when this happened. This was July 4th. And then in this video, you can see they're not quite able to get it all put together before they have to start moving again. But that's one of the the challenges in policing things like this is a lot of times if we allow that group to come back together, then we know that we're going to be facing more violence. But you really have to be careful as you're watching that crowd and you have to be able to read that crowd really well and know that that's actually what's happening before you're gonna take any kind of police action because we are still bound by the rules and just because it's chaotic doesn't mean that the police can just go down there and do whatever they want. Um, I talked a little bit about the thrown objects that we're seeing. Uh, some other things that we're seeing, they'll use a lot of uh, like wrist rocket slingshots. We've got one that has actually, I think, been seized from this event that we can show you. Uh, Lieutenant Hughes is going to go get that. Uh, you'll see two-person slingshots that are supposed to be used to launch water balloons. They'll use those to launch rocks, bottles, other things. Uh, the, the agitators will use paint-filled balloons. They'll throw those at officers trying to hit their face shields on their helmets so that it renders the face shield unusable and the officer has to lift it up. Um, lots of just different things thrown or fired at officers with slingshots, sometimes at pretty high velocity. And then uh, lasers as well. We're going to talk a little bit more about those in a minute. We have found some improvised incendiary devices cached outside some of these events uh, and experienced a, a few of those. Um, and then just a lot of fireworks, some of them very large. This is just a very small sampling of some of the items that you'll see at these things. There's one of the shields. Uh, this a glass bottle over here, and this, uh, this doesn't have cartridges on it, so I'm not sure how much use this uh, face mask would be, but these were, came out of a backpack. This is a shield. So it's half of like a 55-gallon plastic drum, and then they've drilled holes in it for ropes so they can hold it up and use it as a shield. 
and you can see that's this right here. Some of the equipment that folks have brought down here. We'll talk a little bit about the lasers. And pretty early on, we saw a shift from red lasers to green. We're going to talk about why that probably is here in a minute. Um, but lasers have been shined in a lot of officers and state troopers' eyes. We've had a lot of eye injuries reported from this. Uh, and you can see on the left some laser operators in action. It's pretty common, and I'm not sure why this is, to kind of hide behind a sign while you're shining a laser. I think that may be partially because it makes it a little harder to identify the person. This is a crime right here. And you can see the intensity of this laser light. And we actually have one here. This is one of the green lasers that we've, if I can get it to work, you can see just the intensity level of that right there. I'll wait for the shutters to stop clicking. And right there, this is an actual piece of equipment that was seized in one of these events. There's the warning label that says not to point this in people's eyes. Why green? Uh, green lasers apparently are effective at much longer distances. They can actually seriously damage your eyes out to 52 feet. You looked at that earlier video from June 6, those officers are maybe 50 or 60 feet from that line. Uh, and then they can flash blind someone out to 245 feet. And they're a distraction hazard, as you can see, almost to 11,000 feet. At some points, we have had these directed at aircraft from these events. I want to talk a little bit about fire, because this is important in crowd science. So the role of fire, the use of fire in these events is usually intentional. There's something about fire that can sh help shift the, the dynamics of a crowd. And if you look back at a lot of events, whatever kind, that go really bad, even like the celebrations after sporting events that deteriorate into riots, uh, any kind of event that dis deteriorates into civil disturbance, very often fires will get lit, and that is a turning point in the evolution of this event. The fire tends to do something to people, and again, the goal is to try and get people to stop individually identifying and start to coalesce as a group and become group identifiers. The fire has a really important role in that. This might have something to do with the almost nightly fires that we see lit in the fountain where the elk used to be, or when the elk was there, the fires on the elk. Um, and again, it's all about getting this group to coalesce together and then directing it at an objective. These are often made from materials stolen from construction sites, plywood pried off of previously broken windows, or other materials that agitators are able to find in their environment. And then another, this is a picture of arson fires. This comes from the Fire Bureau. This is just from noon on May 29th to noon on June 8th. This map is probably a lot more populated by now. But that is not a normal volume of arson fires for a 10-day period in downtown Portland. The other problem with fire is, especially in older parts of the city where buildings tend to be made of wood and less fire resistant, it is extremely hazardous to the neighborhood and it can spread quickly, especially when it's dry. Uh, another thing that we're seeing a lot of is fireworks. I want to talk just a little bit about this. We've seen everything from small fireworks, like you know, you saw some of the ones like the fountain on the ground, all the way up to commercial grade fireworks display style mortars. Um, this is an example of how those are being used. You can see the people with the shields there. They've thrown down some smoke. Officer comes out to try to address that. You can see an officer stomping out one firework that was thrown. 
This is on July 4th. that went off pretty close to officers. That's another fairly common injury that we're seeing is issues with hearing related to these going off in close proximity. This is another example of the same thing. This has become almost commonplace. And then talk a little bit about doxing. At one point during this event, when the fence was still up, there was somebody down there with a bullhorn reading off names and home, or at least what was purported to be home addresses of police officers. This is just one example of lots of stuff that's out there on the internet. Obviously, anything that comes out in tweets, you take with a grain of salt, but this is just a, gives you an idea of the sentiment that's out there. And then this, I've redacted the addresses here. Not all of these are necessarily accurate. This is online right now. So you can see that there are attempts to get names and addresses of police officers. This is why we made the switch away from name tags on police officers to personnel numbers to try to prevent this. Obviously, this has a, a pretty big impact on people's families. If you have children, this is not a super comfortable thing to have happen to you. So hopefully that helps give a little bit of, uh, of context. And next, I want to talk a little bit about some of our tactics. Um, obviously, I don't want to give people a primer in how to come down and be more successful in this kind of activity, but I'll tell you as much as I can. Um, our crowd management philosophy in the Police Bureau has shifted a lot over the last 10 years, and it's actually been very intentional. And it's really more a matter of event policing than crowd management or crowd control. Those are sort of outdated terms. Um, because policing an event can be anything from not showing up at all because there's just no reason for us to, all the way up to you know, having to engage in some of the, the more hands-on activities that you're seeing in some of these videos. Um, usually for, and as I said earlier, for some of these really large actual protest groups, not showing up at all worked just fine because these were really well-organized events and they didn't need us to make their point. Um, but when we've tried that with the agitator group, they have responded by escalating and escalating and escalating until we can't, we can no longer avoid getting involved because something really bad is going to happen if we don't get involved. Um, we've tried that with this group. It just hasn't worked. A lot of times we will have a lot, uh, we'll have success at trying to work with organizers to facilitate free speech events. We do that all the time. We get varying degrees of interest in engaging with us on that. Um, but this works really well with actual First Amendment events a lot of times because we're able to facilitate traffic control for demonstrator safety. And we have found that when we're able to work together, these events tend to be very successful. Um, but this does not work with this agitator group at all. They will not engage us. Uh, at one point, when we were trying to address the night after night issue in the park out here, we, had, uh, we tried just stationing officers in the park, just in in regular uniforms just to be out there as a police presence to see if that would have a calming effect on people coming into the park for the evening. And it really didn't work very well. We, had a, we ended up getting a group of officers surrounded by a pretty hostile crowd and having to extract themselves from that. Um, like I mentioned before, we tried retreating into the Justice Center and just not engaging the crowd, but they keep up that constant escalation until it would be irresponsible of us in terms of our our public safety responsibilities not to go
go address the issue. Um, we get asked a lot of times, why don't you just go arrest the people who are doing the bad stuff in the back of the crowd? We would like to do that, but that is extremely challenging because of some of the tactics that we see get used. Those, are, those tactics are designed to make it very difficult for us to get to those people. They're designed to put people often with their hands up in between police officers and the people launching things at them. Um, and it, it really is difficult to do that without significant use of force and significant risk of injury to everyone involved. Um, so, you know, there are other ways to try to do follow-up and make cases on people. You can see how masked up people are and how hard it is to identify anyone in a lot of these crowds, so that's pretty challenging. Uh, we do try to remove graffiti immediately whenever possible because just leaving it there tends to help things escalate, and it's also um, not great for our employees to have to walk by some of the sentiments that you saw expressed on walls of our facilities there very often. Which brings me to crowd control munitions. Uh, I know that there is a very significant conversation happening about CS gas right now, and so I'd like to spend just a couple minutes talking about CS gas and the reasons why we use that. CS gas is really a tool that's used to deny area access when a crowd has escalated to a pretty significant level, like a riot. Um, this is not something that we like to use, and prior actually to the election day events of 2016, nobody can remember a time when we used it in the Portland Police Bureau. We think maybe it had been used by some other agencies back in the 60s in Portland, but that's how long it had been. Um, but what we've encountered since then is just a lot of escalating violence, again, to a level that we had not ever seen before in Portland. So when you see the use of CS gas, it's not necessarily because we have somehow reduced our criteria for using CS gas. It is that things have gotten so out of hand that that's really about the only option left. Um, we have a, a very clear policy on that that's available online that you can look up. I won't read that to you, but uh, some of the things that we do, if it comes to that, are we will give multiple warnings, and including a direction to go. Because the thing about CS gas that distinguishes it from pepper spray, pepper spray, if you get exposed to that, is with you for about 90 minutes. CS gas, to stop being exposed to it and stop feeling the effects of it, all you have to do is walk out of it. So we'll give people directions on where to go to avoid this. Uh, you know, I've listened to almost all of these on the radio and listened to our, our incident management team try to lead these events. And, you know, there's one instance in particular where the officers had been taking rocks and bottles for a really long time, and it was time to disperse the crowd, and the incident commander wouldn't let them deploy CS gas because they were still seeing people trying to leave and they waited until everybody who was leaving left and until there was nobody else leaving that crowd and the attack was still happening before deploying CS gas. And the alternatives in the absence of that are, are not very good because if I have to send a group of officers into a crowd like some of the ones that you've seen here to address criminal activity inside that crowd, there is a very high risk to a, a near certainty that someone will get hurt. Um, so what I've tried to do here is, in the time that we have, and I know I've given out a lot of information, uh, is give you just a clear view of what we're dealing with every day. Um, I will close by just mentioning, you know, as I said earlier, something that's very important for us to remember. Just because it's chaotic out there night after night, and just because people are tired, and just because we are pushing our officers and our organization 
really harder than I've ever seen them be pushed before, that's still not an excuse for failing to live up to our standards as an organization. And I know that there have been concerns raised about incidents involving interactions with some of our officers in these events. Uh, and we've referred some of those to independent police review and our professional standards division for, for action. Um, we still have very high expectations of our employees. And by and large, we see them meeting or exceeding those expectations all the time. But please don't misunderstand anything that I have shown you today in terms of the level of chaos that we're experiencing as in any way condoning conduct by our employees that falls short of our standards. So I have gone on for a really long time, uh, but I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. And if you go quickly, anybody in-house has a question, can you go to the microphone right back there and ask that question? We'll be facilitating Zoom questions as well from reporters there. So we'll start with a couple of in-house reporters first, and I'll let you kind of see it from here. All right, I'll do my best. Uh, I have a few questions about the coordination with the federal law enforcement. When did you find out that they were gonna be coming to the city? Uh, well, they've been here all along. The Federal Protective Service has an office in Portland and their responsibility is the security of federal facilities. We did find out at some point, I'm trying to remember exactly when that was, right before the 4th of July, that they had brought in some more resources in order to address a significant amount of damage at their facilities. But that wasn't something that we asked for. And how do you guys communicate with them during the protests? What we've been doing, we've, we're, we're lucky to have really good relationships with some of their command folks from this region, from Federal Protective Service. And so we've had representatives of theirs in our command post so that we at least know what each other are doing. Do, like on, on the 4th of July, they were clearing Portland city streets. Do they need PPB or the city's permission to do that? They really don't. Uh, they have federal authority to enforce, you know, federal laws. And, you know, we are in their jurisdiction anywhere in the United States. So, you know, we, they were really good about just letting us know what they were doing. Um, but no, they don't need our permission to do that. So even things like crowd control, they don't need? As long as it, and, and you'd really need to ask them exactly where their authority goes, but my understanding of it is that as long as it's connected to that mission of protecting federal property from being lit on fire and, and destroyed, yeah, they can do so that. So on the fourth, and sorry, everybody, this is my last question. On the fourth, um, PPB and federal law enforcement cleared west together. Uh, I think I, I may have the streets wrong. PPB was on Salmon and uh, um, Madison, and federal mm -hmm. law enforcement was going up Maine. And on one of those streets, it was PPB and federal law enforcement sort of together in one line. Who's in charge in that situation? Uh, we're in charge of our assets, and they're in charge of theirs. And you'll notice that once that got out into the street, at least my understanding was, once it got out into downtown, away from the immediate vicinity of federal facilities, that they didn't go any farther than that. And, I mean, and so Western. they cleared with PPB all the way up to, I believe, Southwest 6th. And so you're saying that, like, mm -hmm. on one line with PPB and federal law enforcement in a group together, there's two different chains of command and two different people making decisions, two different command elements? That's what I'm saying if they went all the way to 6th with us. Is that tactically sound? That sounds really dangerous to me. Uh, it's probably less than ideal, but that's why we have a representative inside our command post. I don't have authority to order federal officers to do things. Okay, thank you. Can you identify yourself, please, and speak to me and repeat the question if you can? Uh, the, I think the question was... The next question. Oh, I see what you're saying, yes. Okay. Okay. Hey, uh, Sergio, Olmo, Sergio almost freelance. Um, in the beginning, you said you're going to try to make an effort not to refer to what's going on in front of the Justice Center as a protest. Can you discuss the language that you guys use to refer to the people that gather in front of the Justice Center? So the question is th about the distinction between protest and the activity that we've had out here. And to be clear, we have seen some protest out here when a group of people gathers and makes speeches about their cause. That's a protest. When a group of people gathers and sets fires and starts attacking police officers and vandalizing 
government property and, and all of that other kind of activity that we've highlighted here today, that's not protest. That's criminal activity uh, is really what that is. And so we have really been very careful to make a distinction because what we don't want is to conflate peaceful protest about legitimate issues with criminal activity. Those two things don't go together, and we don't want to facilitate the loss of that message about social issues to the story about the criminal activity. Uh, can I just follow up quickly? Um, I just, um, when they start gathering prior to unlawful assembly being declared, are, are you still referring to them as, like, I think you said agitators earlier, um, are they protests that turn into agitators, or anybody that gathers at justice from the start, is that like, are they agitators in the language you guys use? Now, I'm not going to say that anybody who gathers out there prior to one of these events is an agitator. That's, that would not be fair for me to say. What I'm referring to as agitators are people who come down here throughout the night and attempt to instigate attacks on other people and destruction of property. But it's not as simple as just saying everyone who shows up in the park across the street is one thing or the other. Um, you know, you can be a protester holding a sign at four o'clock in the afternoon, and then at 10 o'clock at night, you might still be a protester holding a sign, or you may have switched roles. That's really not up to us. That's up to the individuals engaged in the activity. Thank you. Hmm? Hi, uh, Nick Budnick, Portland Tribune. Um, Nick. I heard you say at one point that uh, there's 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 no th that efforts to dialogue with uh, organizers doesn't work. What actually have you done to reach out to organizers? What have you done to dialogue with these people who uh, are downtown at the Justice Center? What are you doing to try to de-escalate? I haven't heard much about that. So the question, as I understand it, is a couple things. What have we done to try and establish dialogue with the people engaged in the, the criminal activity out here? And then what have we done to de-escalate? The second part of that's going to be a lot longer. I tried to cover a lot of that in here. But uh, we have tried to have our uh, liaison team officers go out. We established that program about a year or more ago uh, with specially trained officers to go out and try to make contact with event organizers or people that can help us facilitate whatever event that they want to have. Uh, we've tried sending them out to, to identify people to talk to about maybe moving these events in a productive direction and uh, received no interest from anyone in the crowd in engaging in that discussion. So that's it, that's, that's what you've done? To try to make contact with the crowds, yes. To try to de-escalate the situation. Uh, the first thing we tried to do was set up the fence after the first night in which you know, the, the situation just kind of showed up on our doorstep. Um, and then we shrank the fence because the size of the fence was becoming a problem in another attempt to de-escalate what was going on now night after night. And then we tried having officers out of sight. So we, and that didn't work. We tried taking the fence down to de-escalate things. And as I said earlier, take away that focus of a lot of the energy that was developing around that fence. Uh, that didn't work. That actually resulted in a lot of, of issues for us. Um, and we, we continue to gauge these situations as we encounter them, and sometimes we don't get involved. The last couple nights, uh, at least until I think late last night, we were able to, to not engage at all. And sometimes, as I, you know, one of the de-escalation tactics I talked about earlier was just not showing up at all. Okay. Thanks. Hi, Clara Shada with KBU News. You've mentioned the various ways that officers have been attacked for mortars, frozen water bottles, all of those things that you've listed. Can you tell us how officers have been injured and how many have been hospitalized? Uh, I, I think it depends on what you mean by hospitalized. I know we have had to send a few to the hospital. I'm not going to talk about specifics of employee injuries because I cannot give specific details of this officer sustained this injury and had this 
medical treatment. Uh, but in general, uh, as I said before, we've had officers injured by things that are thrown at them. Um, and we've seen a fair number of hearing related injuries because of fireworks that were thrown at them and then problems with eyes from having lasers shine in their eyes. And you mentioned that earlier with the green lasers. So that has caused damaging effects. Can you describe for officers or anyone in general how that would manifest into an injury? Um, you know, some ways that might manifest into an injury is trouble seeing. Obviously, but like for, for how long would your vision be delayed, for example? I'm not a, I don't have enough medical knowledge to know, and I think it's a function of how close they were to the laser and how long they were exposed to it. And just to clarify, there have been folks in varying degrees, officers have been hospitalized. Uh, I know that we have sent officers to the hospital. I know okay. of no hospital admissions thus far, and that's one thing that obviously we're very thankful for because it certainly could have happened. We've been very lucky up to this point. Great. Thank you. Hi, Lachey Leslie with K2 News. Um, are any decisions or opinions from elected officials keeping Portland police from holding them back from possibly stopping any protests? or any taking any specific action? I don't like to look at it, at decisions. You know, we had a, a law passed in the special session about CS gas, for example. We took an oath to uphold the law and that law was passed through the way laws are passed in Oregon. And so we will work within whatever constraints we are given to try to keep people safe and to prevent property destruction. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not really, it, lots of people could express opinions about the effects of one statement or another or one action or another. Um, frankly, I have tried not to focus on that and just focus on the really serious issue that we have in front of us and do everything that I can to keep Portland safe. It's been fairly challenging. What would your message be to some of the elected officials that have been very critical of Portland police's response so far? I would be happy to engage with any of them and, and answer any questions that they have. Uh, and I'm also interested, uh, you know, I don't have a monopoly on ideas for how to deal with something unprecedented like this. And so, you know, I'm always interested in input and in constructive input for how we can do a better job. Um, you know, our police officers need our entire community support right now because they are challenged at a level that I have never seen before. And so, you know, I guess my ask is not just of elected officials, it's really of all of our community that it's time for us to come together as a community and make a decision about whether this kind of activity is consistent with our values. And if it's not, how we're going to solve the problem. This is a relatively small number of people. At its largest, these agitator type groups have been maybe a couple thousand. There's 640,000 people who live in this city. So I still don't believe that those actions represent the values of this community. And this will be my last question, but you were describing some very sophisticated tactics. Mm -hmm. Do you suspect organized crime? Is this how you're investigating this? So I know the that, question was is, term, that term was used at the beginning of protests. Uh, so the question is, do I suspect organized crime given the level of organization? Uh, no, I, I don't think it's quite to that level. Um, I, you know, yes, I think it is an organized effort because it, it speaks for itself to see the same kinds of activities night after night after night that suggests a level of organization and coordination, but I'm not gonna go quite so far as to call this organized crime. Hi, this is Max Bernstein Hi, from Max. the Oregonian. Um, you've spoken about the challenges and the different tactics the Bureau's taken, uh, putting up the fence, moving it down, uh, taking officers away from the front of the Justice Center. And you've said this is not sustainable. So what steps is the Bureau going to take going forward if this continues on a nightly basis? And that's why, and the question is what steps will we take going forward given the 
drain on resources to the organization from night after night of this. Uh, that's why, really, uh, this is one of the points that I've been trying to make about all of this is that this is not just a Portland Police Bureau problem. This is a city of Portland local government community problem. And uh, so what we'd like to see is a clear message from our community about whether this is consistent with its values. I think that goes a really long way. I happen to be a big believer in community policing. And we're not going to ever be able independently to just police our way out of a situation like this. This takes all of us in Portland to get together and, and just send the message that this isn't acceptable. And uh, follow up, are detectives still able to, are they um, able to investigate crimes that are occurring and coming into them in the last uh, six weeks? Uh, related to this? No, unrelated. Uh, so the question is whether detectives have been able to investigate crimes unrelated to this. Um, not as much as normal, obviously, because a lot of resources have to be devoted to this. And that's not just detectives. We're seeing issues with patrol call response, uh, first response at crashes and, and crimes in progress and those kind of things uh, as well. But yeah, it's obviously there's a lot of follow-up investigation from a sustained thing like this that, that takes a lot of their time. I'm going to try and take a couple of Zoom questions okay. from Davis if we can. And uh, Lieutenant Hughes, can you see? Go ahead and click on. Make sure that everybody can hear us. Alex Zelinsky, why don't we uh, see if Alex Zelinsky can unmute her microphone? Alex, you out there? Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Go yeah. ahead and uh, ask away. Hi, Alex. I appreciate. Um, hey, uh, so some of my questions were already answered, but. Um, I kind of want to pull back on the way you were describing protesters versus agitators, the east side versus the west side kind of dynamic. Um, I'm curious if there are people who protest outside the Justice Center who aren't engaging in violence or, or not committing a crime. Um, what's the thinking that goes into the decision to use CS gas indiscriminately on those groups? So the question is, what's the thinking that goes into the use of CS gas on a group where obviously at any given time, not everybody in that group is engaged in criminal activity? And that you've just hit on one of the most challenging things about dealing with these events, Alex. Uh, and that's why things have to have gotten to a level where life safety is at risk, uh, either risk of, of injury or worse to either the public or to police officers. So things that we look for, what's the level of that risk? And it's not a check the box kind of assessment. It is an individual assessment based on the totality of the circumstances. And, but in general, we, what, the reason why we'll end up using CS gas is because we're encountering really sustained violence usually by things being thrown at us, like all the things that you've seen in the videos today, uh, and fires being lit. And then to address the issue of indiscriminate use, obviously we don't, we don't want to use CS gas at all. I don't like it. I don't like uh, just you know myself as a professional police officer for the last 26 years. I don't like the idea of having to use something like that in, in our community. Um, but what we try to do to mitigate the effects on people who aren't engaged in the criminal activity is give, as I said before, as many warnings as we can, uh, along with as specific of instructions as we can of which way to leave and make sure that we give people the chance to leave. Where it really gets challenging and where I would ask for the community's help is when people, despite the fact that we are announcing that it's gotten so bad that we're about to use CS gas, they choose to stay there anyway. Um, by that point, we have the authority under Oregon law and the city code to disperse the crowd based on what we're seeing. And so what would really help us avoid that is 
some cooperation from folks who are, who are there who no longer want to be part of the event. And even if you're somebody who maybe has been throwing things, if you choose to leave when we disperse the crowd, you can do that. There's nothing that says that you have to stay there. Um, but, you know, it's a matter of really all of us cooperating with each other to be able to have people go out and express their First Amendment rights without coming to the point where, you know, we have a risk of fire in a neighborhood or we have a risk of getting an officer seriously injured or killed or a community member seriously injured or killed. You know, we've seen some incidents where some of these fireworks don't quite get thrown far enough and wind up blowing up right next to other people in the crowd. Um, when the, the danger level gets to that point, if it's a choice between deploying CS gas or having a fatality, I, I would prefer that you didn't, not you, but I would prefer that we weren't put in the position of having to make that choice at all in the first place. Right, next up, uh, Tess Risky from uh, the Willamette Week. Tess, go ahead. Um, I, I want to know, what is the Portland Police Bureau's specific criteria for declaring a riot? I am glad you asked that. The question is, what is our specific criteria for declaring a riot? And I think, Brian, do we have the, the bullet points that we were going to give everybody on that point? So I can just read it to you, and I'll make this available to all of you, and we can... I mean, we can either post this online in a PDF form, or you can email us and we can get it to you. Uh, and it's in our policies. It's in our crowd, crowd management policy. A riot, under the definition of our policy, is six or more persons engaging in tumultuous and violent conduct and thereby intentionally or recklessly creating a grave risk of causing public alarm, excluding persons who are engaged in passive resistance. And so... That's the legal, that, that definition is derived right out of the Oregon Revised Statutes. In application, we try not to just jump to declaring something a riot as soon as we have six people engaged in tumultuous behavior. Uh, before we're going to declare something a riot, we're going to be significantly north of the conduct described in this policy as I have observed in practice. That's where we're going to, again, see that sustained barrage of hazardous things, thrown uh, fires, that kind of behavior. We're, we're really looking more at, at it in terms of life safety risk. Okay, thanks. I just have a, a quick follow-up on that. Um, I'm wondering, should we expect the Portland Police Bureau to declare riots more frequently now following the passage of House Bill 4208, which prohibits tear gas no, uh, because we don't, we're not going to use that. Because what I don't want to do, and I want to be really clear about this, I don't want to ratchet down our criteria for using CS gas just because we want to be able to use CS gas. What I, the way we approach this question is how can we get out of this situation without having to use force in the first place? Again, we're only one set of decision makers in these situations. There's a whole other set of decision makers out there. Uh, and so what we would ask of them is that they choose to express themselves all they want, just don't engage in activity that's dangerous to other people. I will be very happy if I can go the rest of my career without ever seeing us have to deploy CS gas uh, the reason why we're seeing more and more CS gas has to do with the really unprecedented levels of violence that we're seeing and not that we're trying to find excuses to use CS gas. That would be irresponsible of us to, to somehow ratchet down the definition of a riot so we can get to CS gas quicker. So the question is, who makes the decision about the use of CS gas? And I would 
extend that probably to these, these definitions. That's our critical, or our, excuse me, that's our crowd management incident commander, CMIC. These are generally captains or commanders in the organization with a, a lot of experience managing these kinds of events. And then we have a training program that we put them through at the command level uh, that includes managing crowd management scenarios uh, so that they can get real-time opportunities to think through some of these scenarios and get critiqued on them. But we're pretty careful about selecting and then training these people so that we, we get better outcomes. But this, it, it requires some, some specialty training. It, we don't just make any captain or commander a, a crowd management incident commander. Okay, one more from Zoom. We're going to go with Everton Bailey from the Oregonian, and then we'll come back in house. Hey, everybody. Thanks for taking my question. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, Alex did ask something similar. But, uh, uh, Deputy Chief Davis, uh, you said a few times now that there are a small amount of agitators in the crowd nightly who are engaged in this conduct. But uh, reporting from the media and other folks on the ground has shown that uh, the majority of people So the question is, is related to people who are not engaged in the event at all who may be exposed to CS gas. Um, again, you know, certainly if anyone is exposed to CS gas while they're waiting for a bus and somehow they didn't hear the warnings, didn't see that things were starting to go bad and, and had no idea that this was coming, that's not an outcome that we ever want. Uh, these decisions as I said before, in residential areas like that are especially hard to make because you're constantly trying to balance the risk to the community caused by the actions of people in this group with the, any risks associated with what you need to do to deal with it. Um, that situation up there uh, looked to me like one of the most challenging crowd management situations I've ever seen because of the location, because of the level of violence that was coming from that crowd. And yes, of course, not every single person in that crowd is involved in that. I think that's probably, and I don't want to speak for our incident commanders, um, but I would expect that we would wait a while uh, and that we would try very hard to avoid using CS gas in that situation for exactly that reason because we don't want to have that collateral effect. And you know, as I said, that event went on at a pretty high tempo, high intensity for over an hour. And you know, it's, it's a really difficult situation to be put in. And so my response would be that we would appreciate it, and I know our community would appreciate just not being put in that situation to begin with. Um, that, that would really help us a lot for us to just stop having these kind of events because these are really, really difficult situations in which to keep people safe. Okay, we've got about six or seven more minutes, uh, at least on the schedule. So we'll come back in here and identify yourself and ask questions. Hi, um, I'm Gillian Flackis with the Associated Press, and I'm going to go back to the, fe the presence of federal officers. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that right before the July 4th weekend, you learned that there were going to be additional officers sent from the Federal Protective Service. Do you know um, when you found that, that out, how many officers were sent, and was it just FPS? Were there other agencies like Customs and Border Patrol, uh, you know, U.S. Marshals, et cetera? I mean, mm -hmm. can you give a fuller description of that, please? I can try. The question is to give a fuller description of when I found out, and do you mean when did I personally find out or when did the organization find out? When did, when did the out? police bureau find out? Okay. Uh, when we found out that the federal authorities were adding to the resources that were already here, um, I don't 
remember exactly when that was. Um, I do know that there were resources brought in from a number of agencies within the Department of Homeland Security. Um, I think that included the Federal Protective Service and maybe some folks from Customs and Border Protection. There may have been others. It would, it's harder for me to answer that question than it would be for Federal Protective Services because they know more of what they were doing. At my, in my role, uh, when I found out about that, my biggest concerns were just whatever the federal authorities were doing, that we had some access to them to find out what they were doing so that we could perhaps offer suggestions or at least coordinate efforts a little bit because you don't want to uncoordinated efforts going on in a situation like this. And our, our FPS, you know, we have a, a really good relationship with the FPS command team here in Portland and the Portland, Seattle area. Um, and so, you know, they've been really good about trying to communicate with us about their plans. But, you know, did other people in the organization have more detailed knowledge than me? Probably, because I just made sure that they were connected with our incident commander and just to avoid issues that can come up when two operations like this are not coordinated. And I have a quick, quick follow-up question. Um, you know, do you, do you feel as an agency, and also yourself, you could speak personally, uh, that it's appropriate for the federal government to send additional um, law enforcement officers to the city when Portland police is the primary person on the front lines, given, you know, there's potentially, you could say, a blurring of lines between federal and, and local law enforcement there that, you know, could further inflame tensions or, um, you know, cause problems? Uh, I would prefer not to be in this situation in the first place and not to have had six weeks of sustained violent criminal activity in downtown Portland. Um, you know, it's, it's the federal authorities' prerogative to, to maintain security at their facilities. And uh, I, I would much rather have not been in this, had not had this situation come up in the first place. Simon Gutierrez with KPTV. Uh, the optics of this hasn't changed over the last uh, six weeks or so. We see uh, demonstrators on one side and police and riot gear on the other. Mm -hmm. And yet, in certain circumstances, as you mentioned yourself, some of the best practices have been to allow officers to retreat or to back up, de-escalate, or not show up at all. Why isn't that the standard procedure? Why not wait for something bad to happen before you have police and riot gear confronting a crowd of protesters? The question is, why don't we wait for something bad to happen to have uh, police officers in crowd control protective gear get involved? Uh, the answer is, we have tried that many, many times over the last six weeks. And in some cases where you know, we've had these very large marches that happened without us being there at all, it worked really well. In some cases, the People involved decided to escalate things and set fires and continue to damage property and attack the sheriff's office employees standing on the front of this building to the point where it would have been irresponsible of us as the people responsible for public safety in this community not to try to do something about this significant and growing threat. And a quick follow-up, uh, you mentioned the crowd dynamics and some of the tactics. Uh, uh, the fact that you're aware that that's happening, why hasn't uh, response patterns changed, changed along with that? Like, why couldn't you have officers on one side and then officers on the other side arresting the people doing the crimes? So the question is, why not have officers behind the group to deal with people engaged in criminal activity? And we have tried that in the past, and what happens is then... It, they switch sides and, you know, we'll be confronted with a pretty big fight with people when we try to do that. And, and it makes it very challenging to take those people out of that crowd in the moment. Thank you. Okay, we got time for like two more questions and then we'll have to wrap it up. Uh, Jonathan Levinson with OPB again. I wanted to come back to federal law enforcement one more time. Sure. Um, <laughs> Earlier this week, Lieutenant Jones said that on city streets, PPB is in the lead. And it sounds like from what you're saying right now, that's not the case. So 
if federal officers and Portland police officers are each governed by their own separate set of, of directives and, and rules, uh -huh. a situation like the fourth where you're all in the same place on the same street and co-located, right. does that mean that the federal law enforcement isn't bound by the temporary restraining orders in place? And if that is the case, uh -huh. doesn't that effectively invalidate those restraining orders if they can disperse uh, media and legal observers and they can use impact munitions? That effectively invalidates them, right? Um, I'm not quite sure I'm, I'm, I think of it quite the same way. Uh, the question is whether the presence of federal officers under federal authority somehow invalidates the temporary restraining order uh, governing the use of CS gas and crowd control munitions. Um, I, that's a matter of opinion. I, I mean, I don't think so. Other people might. but. I, the way I would respond to that is that I don't have authority over federal officers. They're governed by their own policies and procedures. They are acting under federal law, federal authority, which is not something that I have a whole lot of experience with. Uh, and so some of these questions about the actions of federal law enforcement authorities are really much more appropriately answered by those authorities themselves. Um, it does complicate things for us, and we try to deal with that complication the way we did through the relationships that we have with these folks who are part of a different government than us, uh, and, and the coordination that we're able to have when they show up so that at least we know what each other is doing. But, you know, it's, it's their job to maintain the security of federal facilities in Portland, and I am really not qualified to give them instructions about how to do that job. But I would suggest uh, that they could probably give you much better answers about those things than I am qualified nice. to. <laughs> okay, last question. Thank you. Hi, Claire Rashado with KBU News again. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, Deputy Chief Davis, can you clarify a statement that was made in a video statement by you that stated, members of the press do not have a right to document protests once a dispersal order has been made? Uh, I don't remember saying that, and if I did, then that would have been a mistake on my part. Members if it was a mistake, sorry to interrupt you, can you clarify whether or not that is an accurate statement, whether or not we're made by you or not? So I said that members of the press are not allowed to document... A protest once a dispersal a order has been made? protest once a dispersal order. Uh, again, I, I'm not... That rests on the assumption that I said that, but if I said... If I actually said that... Uh, no, members of the, we encourage members of the press to document news. And I just sent out an internal email actually yesterday uh, reminding officers that members of the media have a job to do. Now, members of the press in general, up until the, the most recent temporary restraining order, are not exempted from the law that says that people have to leave an area when lawfully ordered to do so. Um, but yeah, I'd be interested if you can show me where I said that on video, because if I said that, that would have been a mistake on my part. Okay, thank you. All right, time to wrap it up. All right, thank you. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate you being here today, and uh, thanks for all your questions. And you can contact uh, myself or the PPD PIO at portlandoregon.gov. That's the Public Information Officer Department for the Police as well. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Tom.